VER presents HDSLR Shooter, live from Cinegear 2017, sponsored by Blackmagic Design and Carl Zeiss. Hi, Clint with HDSLR Shooter, continuing our coverage of Cinegear 2017, and I am here with Vance, Lucas, and Jody, and I have gathered you gentlemen here uh, to speak to uh, your all DPs, or filmmakers, let's say, and I brought you gentlemen here to discuss shooting with Blackmagic cameras, and uh, we'll talk about you know your various models. But I know that I know you, Lucas, have been shooting since the Ursa. I don't know if you used the the yeah. MCC, but uh, uh, t uh, tell us uh, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, uh, initially. Right. So I've dabbled with the BMCC when it first came out. Was that four or five years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, professionally, we started implementing when the Ursa came out, the 4K, the big boy. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, we shot a series. Um, of shorts actually for a client and that's actually when I think we first met there mm -hmm. um, but it, they've come a long way since the 4k sensor now we're the 4.6 sensor sure come a long way um, with, especially with the dynamic range with the 800 ISO so so uh, Vince talk a little bit about uh, what kind of work you do and and, and uh, uh, just generally speaking um, well, I've been a cinematographer 30 years. Mm -hmm. and I started out in the lighting world. Mm. Um, you know, I was a theatrical lighting designer, concert lighting designer, came into, you know, film and I've been shooting for about 30 years and, uh, you know, made that transition from, you know, uh, film to digital. Mm -hmm. You know, I shoot a lot of, I've shot probably a thousand music videos, feature films, commercials. Uh, I shoot a lot, a lot of commercials these days, and uh, some music stuff when it's creative and interesting. Jody, talk about uh, your experience. Well, first off, uh, we, we have a Brit, we have a guy from Chile, and we have a guy from Louisiana, so do I need to use a Louisiana <laughs> Southern <laughs> accent? Australia. Oh, you're an Australian? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that was, I just made a horrible error. My extreme apologies. <clears throat> you, you heard about the, uh, the guy, that, the Brit, who went to Australia, and uh, he was a young guy, and the customs guys were looking at him kind of funny. And uh, they asked him some questions and wanted to see his passport. And this is the Australian customs guys, right? And he said, um, "Have you ever uh, have you committed any crimes?" And he said, uh, "I didn't know that was still necessary to get into the country." Oop. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. <clears throat> so yeah, I won't use my. Who let this guy in? Then. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I've been living in LA for uh, for 33 years and have done kind of a range from the typical freelancer's life, you know, from television news network news and docs to. Uh, cameraman on episodic TV shows, JAG and NCIS back in the day, and um, to a lesser degree, commercials and promos and kind of a, a wide range of stuff. And I've been mostly um, a Sony guy, and I still love Sony cameras. I've been a tester for them for probably 15 years. So I kind of come from the Sony F55 world. And then um, Blackmagic said, hey, would you like to try out this camera, the 4.6 Carrier and Mini, and see what you think? And you know, if you like it, tell people. And I do like it, I like mm. it a lot. So I've shot with it for about a year, a uh, year and a half, and then with the, uh, the Ursa Mini Pro, which has the same sensor, um, since it came out a few months ago, and very, very pleased. I mean, we all have very similar experiences. Yeah. None yeah. of us are fanboys, none of us work for Black Magic. No. We'll use anything out there that does the job, and it's really doing the job very, very well for us. So, uh, Vance, uh, what, uh, what camera did you most recently shot with? Was it the, the Mini, or Ursa Mini Pro? Or? Uh, Ursa Mini, in the Black Magic world, Ursa Mini Pro, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I had that for pretty much since they, they dropped that camera, I'd have one. What, like in April? Yeah. Something uh, like that? Yeah, it was pretty quick. What, what have you shot with it? Um, I've, I, I have shot a, some music video stuff with it. I just shot a Dish Network commercial with it. I shot a... Um, I hop commercial with it. A I, what? I hop. Oh, really? Yeah, and I just did this. Oh, there's. I hate to say it, there's some one a, a Roken Roken box, the TV box. Ro oh, Roku. 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 Hey, yeah, yeah. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. Roku. But oh, we don't work for them. Ro they don't, they, they don't work for us. Uh. So you know, <laughs> it, it's interesting because you know, uh, first one I'd mixed Alexa and I had an Alexa and the Ursa. And I challenge anyone to tell me which camera's which after color. Did you cut those together pretty flawlessly, seamlessly? Yeah, I mean, they flawlessly cut. I mean, you, you gotta look at the, if you look at the ARRI RAW, or the, you, the, uh, the log C on ARRI, 
and the roar on the earth, so they don't look the same. They're a little different, right? But it looks he's a little flatter, actually. It looks he's a little flatter. But at the end of the day, once you run it through Resolve, yeah. you really can't. I, yeah. I couldn't tell. I had a colorist who was telling me that he thought that the color signs for the Airy and the Ursa Mini were very, very similar. I think they are. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a job with the original Ursa, the, four, the first Ursa 4.6K, and I took it into color, and it was just sent in as a XML with a 444 ProRes file, 3840 by 2160. And halfway through the session, says, man, I love the look of the Alexa. <laughs> Guess what? It wasn't an Alexa. It wasn't the Alexa. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I do love the look of the Alexa, don't get me wrong. I use that camera all the time. That, it's like, wow. but, yeah, because they're looking at the footage. That was a yeah, colorist yeah. that does it for a living. So, yeah. Lucas, talk about your experience uh, recently. What, have you, are you working with the Ursa Mini Pro right now? Or? Yeah, right now we're the pro. I um, also run a company, Moai Films. And so as a company, as it's, this is also a business. It's not just a hobby. You know, a hobby or even as an are artist, as a DP. People are paying it's, you money it's, Apart from, right? We'll, we'll talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it makes more sense to own cameras that give you the same, same similar image than Alexa does. And you can have five of them on set instead of one Alexa. So that's what I'm seeing a lot that what we're doing and a lot of people around me are doing. But like he was saying with the Alexa Mini, just two weeks ago, uh, we were doing a commercial and we had both of those. We had the Ursa Pro and we had the Alexa together. And in a controlled environment, we were doing everything. They looked exactly the same to my eye, to everyone. Nobody could tell the difference. At the end, we had a little bit of time. I took my AC to the side. We did a couple extreme tests, extreme contrast situations. And there, the only thing I could notice is a little bit extra. It's a little smoother in the roll off of the highlights, just a little bit. Um, the the black magic wasn't as smooth in the transition, but that's. I mean, you're going extremes. There. We're talking about 15 stops of dynamic range, mm -hmm. where I mean, very unlikely that you're going to blow your image that far. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, did, I, had a, I shot a movie uh, last year, and I got my first Ursa, the regular Ursa, during the movie, and we had uh, we had a studio Alexa, we had uh, two minis, and I land up bringing that in, and land up supplementing a lot of stuff with that camera. And I just had it flying on a Ronin and running around with that. And it's in the movie and it's, it's, it's scope. It looks great. I mean, I, I, you couldn't pick which was which. So, I mean, you know, we're using that as a standard, as Alexa, as that's the best you can right. get. So if, it, if, you know, and you're saying that it's comparable to it, are there any qualities that you're finding, especially in this 4.6K sensor where I don't know. I mean, we're talking about opinions on what looks good, but uh, uh, where you feel like the the black magic sensor is maybe better or or, or different, it gives you something different you that you can't find. I can give you a brief anecdote on something that I know he's seen. <clears throat> um, a friend and colleague of ours, Roy Wagner, is in the ASC, and he was Ansel Adams' camera assistant as a young man, so he knows a little bit about images and photography and printing and all this jazz. And, I shot a little overexposure test for him with this camera just to see what it would do, you know, in a super blown out scenario. So I shot stuff that was ridiculously overexposed. I mean, faces that are like pure white, you know, you can't, like, it's totally unusable, right? <clears throat> and we put it in post and we were able to not only make it usable, but it actually looked very good. And I was shocked. Yeah, and so I'm... I sent Roy over to the colorist and I said, I want you to see this in 4K. It has placed what we did, the before and after. And he calls me and he goes, I am astonished. I have never seen a camera that can pull back that much from being overexposed. And Roy's a guy who used F65, you know, Alexa Red, 35 millimeter film. He's done it all. And he was kind of blown away by this. And he's sort of a senior guy. And so I kind of have taken that to the bank. I'm like, all right, if Roy gives this a big sign off in that area, then, um, then I'm, I'm pretty good to go with it. So that is one area where I think it does exceed other cameras that I have seen and used and even some that I haven't used is in that. I don't know what your guys' experiences are I mean, with that. I mean, mine is more about the filmic look of the sensor. You know, Which is I'm, more important it's, than It's more important, else. it's yeah. very film-like. You know, I was one of those guys that shot, shot millions and millions of feet of film. And we hear tell about you guys. Kicking and screaming, <laughs> hanging on my, my nails. I would refuse to shoot digital. Avoided it. Until Alexa came along. Mm -hmm. And this is the camera that I feel feels image-wise, because I care about image. I don't, I've never care, been 
so about K's, you've got 8K, I don't care. Mm. It's about the image at the end mm. of the day. Because we're not looking out a window capturing real life, we're telling stories. That's right. We're creating worlds, we're creating illusion. I don't want to be feel like I'm looking out a window. I don't want things that clean. It's got to have a, it's got to have a, an emotional quality to the image. Kind of an ethereal quality. Yeah. There could be something else. And, and some people do else. complain, rightly so, about some of the 4K cameras having a kind of a video edge to them. Mm -hmm. They look, they don't look storytelling-ish. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he's saying, it's it's yeah. sort of like we're looking at a live shot or looking at a soap opera or something yeah. like that. He, and as storytellers, he, we're not, we're usually not looking for that. No, you know, we're really not. And this camera, I, I think, does a fine job. It does that. a fine job. Yeah. yeah. And like he says about the image, so and it's not about the resolution or how big the, the That's size right. is. Um, I've been working now with Dolby on some HDR tests with them, and we've actually been using the Pro uh, on this HDR technology that they're pushing with Dolby Vision. Um, and so they were kind of surprised at first that that this six thousand dollar camera can deliver HDR just as an Alexa could. So and so that's that's one of my experiences that I can share. That's it's not just about resolution. More importantly, it's HDR and how how the image looks. You know? And frankly, yeah, really if you took away that six thousand dollar price tag, if nobody knew right. how much this camera costs, that you would have a lot of people saying, man. That, that looks like the new Alexa Mini or the new yeah. F55 or whatever. No, you know? when you do a blind taste test, as you were saying, you know, with a colorist, you know, uh, you know, they can't tell if it's Coke or Pepsi, you know, yeah. at the end of the day. The so. thing is, you know, realize that cinematographers, we have our own view. I mean, every one of us has our vision. People like our aesthetic or they don't. Uh, you know, it's my how my eyes see it. I, that's all it is. I, it's what I care about. Right. You know, I, sure, there's things I'd like them to change, but it ain't it ain't the way it looks. It may be some ergonomic stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, right. But the sensor, the sensor. That's good. Yeah. And it always comes build, down to and build around that sensor. You're gonna be in good shape. Vance and Lucas and I have had this conversation as well with ourselves and with others is that we can make good pictures with just about any camera. I mean, my gosh, you can take an iPhone and you light it right and it's going to look okay. So it's not as much about the camera in many, many situations as it is, you know, the folks who are working it and the lights and the stuff that you're using, not to mention storytelling, of course. But when we get to the place where we want to be having the maximum impact with our images, then the camera part of it does really matter. But what I have found, I think what we've all found with this camera, is that it does provide the firepower we need to do whatever it is we need to do. Now, I may not use it to shoot an IMAX film. I might want something with a bigger sense, 65, 70, whatever it may be. Yeah. But for anything else, episodic TV, feature films, I have no hesitations with it whatsoever. It's The camera is completely adequate, even more so than that. And um, I don't know if you yeah. and I were talking about this earlier, but it's like you go have a meal with somebody. People always talk about the camera, like, wow, that's such a great camera. You took such great images with that camera. It's not as much about the camera as it is the person. You go have a nice meal at someone's home, they prepared this delicious meal, and you take a bite, are you gonna say, wow, you must have a really great oven? <laughs> you know, no. It's true. But that's it, what you true. hear about camera. You must have a really great camera. Yeah. <laughs> we have an adequate camera, it's really it's good. It's all about how you see the cook. The yeah. camera's still a tool, for, it's yeah. a recording device. Yeah. yeah. So it's digital, it's not film. But I don't care what camera you got. If you can't put, make something beautiful in front of it, it's not gonna, Yeah. It's true. Yep. And what Lucas shot a cool thing in, in this car that we were talking about, uh, that he was, you know, just on the outside. You can well, tell him about tell not having to ND the windows, that yeah. whole thing. Yeah, this I mean, that's great. that's another thing from moving from the older 4K sensor with maybe 12 stops of dynamic range to something with 15 stops now. What we were talking with Jody is the fact that it's it makes it more flexible. It's faster to use. Like before I was having to ND car windows, you know, NDing windows on the outside, where now you can actually see all that information. You don't have to, you can go ahead and shoot without NDing any of the windows on the cars, and you're not blowing that out. You still have exposure, you give a little fill inside, and you still see what you want to see outside. Saves money, same time. And I'm sure um, some of your underwater stuff, when you're looking up, you know, stuff that would normally blow out, looking at the sky, yeah. you well, want you that know, kelp to be lit. The thing with the 4.6 sensor, it's built from the ground up. I mean, it, the color science is really, really good. And that's the key to it. Yep. You know, it's not an off-the-shelf sensor. It's built from the ground up. It's built to interface with DaVinci Resolve. So they talk to it. The sensor, they talk to each other. And it's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Man. The dynamic range is one thing, but the color science of, the, of that sensor is the key. Yeah. Really, I love it. Uh, Vance, neutral. talk a little bit about that, because you're taking this Ursa Mini Pro uh, underwater. Yeah. I've. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been talking to Nordicam. Hydroflex 
has a basically standard, you know, standard housing. They can put 15 camera bodies in it. Just, I just made, I had a plate built to standardize the center to match an Alexa so it goes on an ARRI BP9 base plate and everything lines up in the same position. Take that, put that plate on, put it inside the um, Hydroflex housing. You've got an underwater camera. Yeah. My, the reason why I ask about that is because well, you don't get a second shot, you know, if you're underwater. It's not like you have to take the camera out, you know, of the water and then uh, replace it. I mean, that's a big deal if the camera fails. So it's a huge confidence that you have in the camera if you yeah. take it uh, below the surface. Yeah, I mean, it depends. If you're in a tank shooting actors, it's a little easier. But if you're out in the not ocean... Not that much easier, though, right? No, not that much easier. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's... It, I have confidence in the camera. It's got it. It works great. I, I own a Nordicam Alexa Mini housing, mm -hmm. and I have I have a 4K the 4K production camera housing, pocket cam housing, Nikon D800 housing. I'm about to get an housing a housing for this Ursa from Nordicam, and but you know we have this thing set up at Hydroplex where you can you can run uh, Preston remote through it. The whole nine yards. It's great. Really, really good. Reliability is something that they do ask us a lot about, like you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, they were asking me, and I mean, I've put that thing through a bunch of desert shoots. If you ever shot in the desert, you know that your gear gets absolutely filthy. It keeps running. I've shot in the snow in the mountains here in, in Big Bear, where I've had snow fall on top of it and melt, go in, and actually nothing happened to it, keep running. Um, so it's definitely durable, um, and it's flexible. Like for me, that's one of the, the biggest things is that it's versatile. You can use it, like you said, you, can, you just put it on a Ronin, just put it on a gimbal, I've put it on a drone before, yeah. um, and the fact that now you can finally change your, your mounts, you know? So if you want to go really lightweight, you can put on an EF mount if you want, um, or you can go with the, with the PL. So it's not only for one specific thing, like you were saying, we can use it for TV shows. I shot 20 episodes of a docu-series this year on that camera, a different setup than what I would normally use for a, a, a narrative film or a commercial, but it allows itself for that kind of flexibility. Yeah. In fact, well, you know, last, I was going to, just to add to that, they have a B4 mount as well for ENG for sure, lenses, yeah. two-thirds. And last week, I did a whole day run and gun ENG type stuff, shot it in 2K windowed, which allowed me also to shoot at 120 frames per second slow-mo. And I shot all day with it, just like it was an F800 XD cam or whatever. It had the same functionality, felt just as familiar as the cameras I used shooting news all those years. And then when I'm done, put the PL back on and I got a cinema camera again. It's pretty no, cool. that aspect of it is is, is uh, the, the mounting scenario. And when they announced that, you know, it was like, I was like, well, we'll see how this works, you know, because uh, everybody else, if they have some sort of thing like that, it's going to cost you upwards of a grand, uh, you know, at least. To and if you send your camera in and have them do it, mm -hmm. it takes five minutes. minutes. After about 10 minutes, what I do do, though, you know, in the instructions, like, I, I'm a PL man. I live in, I don't live in any other world myself. Right. It's, everything is PL. Pull the EF mount. They, you're supposed to add a, add a ten thousandths of an inch or ten thousandths of a millimeter shim. I took it to Otto Nemmons, my mm. regular camera house, had them do focal flange depth and they had to change the shim out. So if you do change that mount, take it to a camera house and have them check focal flange depth. That's good Especially advice. with PL mounts. Especially with PL mounts. Um, one of the things that, in, in regards to confidence, just getting back to that really quickly, was if you're going to take it to the top of a mountain or under underwater if you're like you know not in a tank you know or in yeah. the desert or someplace else it's not like you, if you're in a remote area like that i mean i'm sure you bring a backup if you can but they're not gonna be able to fly you out another one and still save the day you know uh so that is a huge confidence to be able to say well, that the thing well, now too because instead of bringing for the price of one alexa you can bring out six of these or that's right maybe eight ten of, of them yeah <laughs> I mean, sixty thousand or six you know you can so it's you can have multiple backups in that i mean case, I, 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 I mean I would always take it back. I yeah. never would do a job like that without a backup body. Well, sure, yeah. you have a backup, but I mean, even with a couple of backups, you don't. If you had any thoughts that this might fail, and I'm going someplace where it's going to be a 24-hour delivery at the very least, uh, uh, it's not something you would even want to play with. I don't think. I've never had a camera go down. I had one. You had one. You want a story? Sure. <laughs> so uh, I shot one of the first. Um, films for Black Magic, it was Pirate's Tale that came out at NAB last year. Mm. And, and well, during that shoot, that failure is a little during that little shoot, <laughs> it, yeah, it was not a Black Magic <laughs> issue, but we had that the Mini on the drone 
flying over Laguna Beach real low to the ocean and a wave crashed against the rocks and splashed up right as we were flying through it. So it soaked the camera body, but that's not the camera's fault. It's not meant to go underwater. Right. The Unless footage was fine. I was like, how, how are my clips? Are they good? Pull it out, everything was there, even though it was still running and recording while that happened. Uh, everything was there. The drone was flying, but what got all the water was the actual camera. The camera was fried. toast. Yeah. But that's, I mean, <laughs> drop any camera in the water, that's what that's But that's happen. the only failure you had. That's yeah. pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Let me ask you guys, um, it's funny, because uh, another manufacturer was here re uh, just before you guys, and we were talking about, well, we put ProRes on this, and we're not quite sure, like, you know, are people going to utilize it or not? I mean, uh, not ProRes, I mean, they put RAW, and they're not quite sure whether or not they're going to use the RAW or not. We'll have to see what the end user winds up doing with it. Let me ask you, uh, in your day-to-day -day workload, uh, how is, are you mostly using ProRes, or are you using RAW? And uh, just talk a little bit about your experience, because it's a whole other world. I, uh, I, 90% RAW. Really? Yeah. Harry, I shoot Harry raw 90% of the time, though I have, have been using, there's some requiring 3840-2160, which mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do that in ProRes 444, but, you know, just because I, you know, I've got, everything's there on raw. Sure. I've got more data, I've got more information, so I shoot raw about 90% of the time, on everything. Yeah, for us, it's, it's about this, the post schedule. So, and, and because the camera is flexible, you can do that. So, for example, in the docu series that we did for TV, 20 episodes, we shot that in ProRes. Um, we had to get those out every week uh, to the air. Every Sunday they aired. So we shot in ProRes. We had our LUTs ready to go, and it was, it was much faster in post. Now, anything that's commercial work or, or feature work, then we put it in RAW. We, have all, we want to spend extra time in post to sweeten the image as much as possible, get as much detail out of it. And so then that's all raw, 4.6 and 4 to 1. I see zero difference with the lossless raw to the 4 to 1. So we're shooting 4 to 1 um, for all that stuff when we have extra time, commercials, features. Yeah, raw does not have to be a scary thing. I mean, it used to be not long ago that raw were these massive, gigantic files, and oh my gosh, grading this is going to be a nightmare. And it's really not. I mean, the 4 to 1 that he's talking about compression on there, it's 180 megabits per second. That is not gigantic files for 4.6K in RAW, 180 megabits. That's not that big of a deal. So that's manageable. It's very, very manageable files. Um, I think part of what we need to do is educate people that RAW is not a scary thing. It is not that difficult to it's grade okay to be at raw. all. It is completely okay to be raw. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, ProRes XQ is larger files than the RAW. That's true. Yeah. yeah, so it's just it's just not and the issue that it used to be. Like, why would really? You do that? Yeah. They're the larger. Yeah. Yeah, some of them absolutely are. I mean, you look at the codex and you look at the megabit per, per second rate on these things and you'll be quite surprised. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is. I mean, uh, you can end with the, on the, you can only do 40 frames at UHD 4K, but I can do 60 on three to one raw, raw or natural or full raw. Right. Wow. So a higher frame rate. Higher frame rate. Right. And then once you get into resolve and drop it in there, you can drop a any type of luck on there that you like and you're getting pretty darn close to having a finished look right there. Yeah. And depending on what you've shot, and if we're shooting a feature and there are all kind of different scenes and stuff, it's different. But once you kinda of decide on your look, you can set a grade and take that and post it to you know, shots later, it's, it, guys like us can do some pretty decent work in Resolve without having to have a whole lot of colorist training. We're not colorists, yeah. you know. I'm a bit more anal. I, I, I'm not a lot guy. I never, anything I ever use a viewing lot, I never put a lot on anything. Not I even, but you for, for viewing, yes, but not monitors, on. monitoring, and that's yeah. it. And I think LUTs are a little bit overrated for Resolve. Shot by shot. But it, it de scares people from when they see that, like, look how easy it is. You can get close with that. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. do, I wouldn't color a project yeah. doing that. But it's something that when people see it, they realize raw yeah. does not need to be terrifying at all. And you know, it's I, after you know, 30 years of coming off, sitting in telecine with film coming off an egg, or, or, or chemical color timing, that doesn't scare me at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, they're about to push us out of here. I could continue this conversation all day. Uh, give me real quick, uh, uh, do you guys have a website if people want to find out more about you? Uh, yeah. Talk about it, Vance. VanceBurberry.com. VanceBurberry.com. Yep. Yeah, lucascolombo.com, same thing. Instagram as well, just my name, Lucas Colombo. Lucas Colombo. Yeah. 
Uh, just Google I look like James Cameron dot com. I look and, like <laughs> yeah. but I but I don't behave like him. No, no. <laughs> and my checking account is completely different from this. No, you just have to Google my name and you'll find stuff out there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jody and gentlemen. Thank you guys so much for stopping by. Yep. You thank mm-hmm. you, Glenn. VER presents HDSLR Shooter, live from Cinegear 2017, sponsored by Blackmagic Design and Carl Zeiss.